what do we got? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. My name is Devin Morgan. I'm the director of youth baseball at Driveline, founder of the Driveline Academy, and this is the Driveline Academy podcast. And I am joined, as per usual, with Driveline Academy coaching operations coordinator Tony Davila. Good morning, good afternoon, Tone. Good afternoon. It's not the morning anymore because we've had a long day of meetings so far. And I'm also joined by a Driveline Academy coordinator of like various hats and little like non-specific role, but just like snake shooter to his core, Jeremy Tectiel. Good morning. Um, we're also joined by uh, Driveline Academy uh, co-host, uh, our friend, Miss Tournament McTournamenty uh, Championship Goblet thing. Uh, I was going to drink from it, but like, I mean, come on. Um, it's a lot heavier. Would have been a little much. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's kind of hefty. Um, so we'll get to the tournament thing. Um, surprise, we actually have a sponsor for this, uh, this episode. Uh, first time in the podcast history, uh, we have an ad read to do. Uh, the sponsor of this episode is Driveline Academy. And the ad read we have to do is about joining the Driveline Academy as a coach. It's not really an ad read. Um, but what we wanted to kind of uh, talk about was, yes, we are hiring for um, coaches within the academy, which is kind of like a, it's an opportunity to talk, I think, about player development and coaching. Uh, and, and, and like, sure, man, if if you're a, a young man or woman or an old man or woman, because we're not going to age discriminate, um, and you're passionate about leading young men and women and teaching this game and communicating at like an elite level. It's like the Dave Chappelle, Ezra James, like, please come to us, you know? Um, but I think we can also kind of get into the weeds of like the part of things where it provides leverage for your future coaching career because of the experience and the tools you get access to. So here's the pitch. Uh, so Max Dudo, guest on last episode of the Driveline Academy podcast, uh, director of R&D, uh, reposted something on Twitter and, and he probably did a better job of, than I did of like telling the story. And I think the phrase that really resonated for me that Max hit on was this idea of like true player development. And so what do we understand, right? There's a lot of men and women that are looking to get started as coaches, uh, largely, you know, guys and girls that finish their playing career and they are addicted to this game much like we are and like want to continue so you figure that like the path forward is coaching um simultaneously i think one of the things that we struggle with and i, and I think everybody struggles with is trying to find good coaches that want to train younger players which is why a majority of the the ecosystem revolves around parent coaches because it's easier to a degree to just find a parent who hopefully is this going to be the uncensored podcast or? i think we said it was okay yeah. fuck it so uh so you're trying to find a parent that's not a fucking asshole. <laughs> you're trying to it, like that. And that's baseline. Yeah. But like it's but it's also not baseline because for a lot of programs, that shit is just tolerated and accepted. Yeah. In a way that like would never be accepted f for me as a parent with a child or with a teacher that has access to my child. Like you you yes. do that shit when it comes to my kids in school and we're going to have a fucking problem. Yeah. In baseball, a lot of times it's just like, well. I was taught by uh, degenerate, um, bitter alcoholics. So the behavior that I model is, you know, it's it's the hurt people, hurt people thing again. But but again, the problem is, is that I think there's a reluctance for people that want to start in youth baseball because the poison pill you have to swallow is dealing with young players. But the thing I want to come back to is what Max hit on of true player development. Because that's what it really is when you're working with young kids who are just like supremely adaptable to the stimulus structure and systems that you put them on. Man, you set that culture, right? So, so a lot of times it's like, you know, we struggle to attract coaches. I think everybody does at that age because there's a presumption that those kids are going to be wild and out of control and undisciplined. Okay, look at the Japanese all-star team. Or right? their little league team, yeah. Right. I mean, look at the way that those teams function. I, I mean, everybody's seen on Twitter like the training schedule that they execute. That gets floundered around about every time we run into Little League World Series. Those kids are responding to structure, stimulus, and 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 I'm not saying that that's necessarily the model that we should all run, right? Like, uh, tune into the Driveline R and D podcast and listen to Brandon Man talking about how like the onboard was you need to throw like two thousand pitches in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Maybe that model isn't great. Um, but but I, but I I think it is reasonable to go like kids respond to the structure system and and just like what we put them into right. 
So if you're a coach who really wants to test how good your stuff is, I would offer that like stress testing it against an 11 or 12 year old team, man, it it will challenge you. Cause I've done that thing where it's like, I'm sitting at home and I'm like drawing up my practices and I've got my cones and station one, station two, station three, station four. And you do all this stuff and then you hit the field and it's like, Oh, none of this works. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work because it's either like the objectives aren't clearly defined enough or the structure is too complicated and it's like, okay, well, if this fails at 12, it, it might fail at 18. It might fail at 21 at a junior college. Like, because to a degree, when I watch better coaches than me, your Watsons, Saudi, John, brands that we just hired, like when I watch these guys, Neither of us. you guys, <laughs> Jeremy knows how much I love him because he's coaching my son. Tony knows how much I love him because I've seen what he's in with our 16U team, but I'm pa- okay. Fair enough. That was, that was fair. When I watch really good coaches uh, of all stripes, it's generally understanding a problem at a really high level and the distilling that down to a way that is palatable and digestible for your athletes. So for you person that's considering taking a volley job, getting paid $0, getting to sleep on the the weight room floor and getting a limited supply of free PB and J's and hot and sweaty pizzas, I, I would suggest that there's another path. And the other path is not only do you can't to like stress test your stuff and see how good you are at player development, but the support that we provide, which yeah. is tools and structure that are going to get you a chance to try some stuff out, get really, really good at developing your players, stress test it, and then wherever your career takes you. Yeah, and I, I think a big thing is like, especially with, you know, specifically our academy is the technical skill training you're doing at those younger ages doesn't change. Right. It's the environment does change a little bit, but the technical skill training that we're doing with our 12 and 13 year olds doesn't necessarily change when it's our 15 and 16s or even our 18s. Like there's a little bit of a modification, but the foundational philosophies and how we execute that training is very similar. So it's not like you're going down to 12 and you're just, teaching them bunts and things like that. You're doing the same kind of technical training that our 16 year olds and our 18 year olds are doing just in a slightly different environment with 12 year olds and stress testing your, your ability to run a, execute a practice at that age. And yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's skills of skill for a reason. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that's, that's one of the things, you know, Alex Harder was on the, the R and D podcast yep. uh, recently and talked about how like, it is, it's one thing to do it in a controlled environment in your, your own gym or your facility. And it's another thing when you have to like get out to a field and, and, and put it to the test. Um, so this is something that scales really well. If you can do it with a younger team, this is still an issue that like a division three college coach had. Yep. That like, oh, things are pretty frantic and chaotic once we get out here and like we got to adapt on the fly and like our plan that we made, yeah, throw that one out the window. Like yep. we got to make a, adjustments on the fly. And the same thing holds true for any age. Yep. Uh, and, you know, we last night we had practice and uh, I was told by one of our assistants that the 13 group is unruly. Unruly. And uh, I was like, well, I don't have a problem ruling them most of the time. Sure. Like, they might be unruly if you don't give them the structure. Yep. And if they're just kind of, like, led to run around and be chaotic. And, like, yes, I think that is a lot of times a self-fulfilling prophecy where, like, 10s, 11s, 12s, are unruly because they're bored. They're not engaged with like going out to a field, someone rolling out a bucket of balls and saying, play catch to warm up. Right. Like if you like, I have seen what we do in our gym with like the long-term athletic development and the games that we play with them for throwing and hitting and they're engaged. They're not, they're not unruly. That's, that's a fully self-fulfilling prophecy that like if the coach thinks they will be, that he's probably not going to play in super hard for practice. And then in turn, those kids are going to be really hard to deal with because they're 10, 11, 12 and they're bored. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it is just literally a thing that you can solve for through structure and engagement. Like, both both of those things are the best bullets you can fire at the problem of having young kids that you feel aren't aren't doing the things that you want them to do. At the end of the day, this is just what it revolves around, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we want to have enough uh, effort and attention and practice to get uh, the volume numbers that we need just for, for just, I guess, stimulus, right? And you also need that to be paired with a really specific intention. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, again, I think part of part of the thing for us uh, in hiring is that like, I think my thing was talking about like excellent leaders and communicators. 
because because that's how you rule, right? Like that's that's the system is 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 creating structure and expectation for what you do and how you do it. And and certainly to a degree, I suppose it is possible and likely that like the the need for kind of like maintaining compliance is a little bit higher with older with with younger kids. Sorry. Um, but I've also heard horror stories about just like slap. Oh, I'm sorry. Slap dicks. This is the uncensored. Part. I was going to say, you, you already yeah. said fuck. You yeah, can say fuck. slap dicks. Yeah, you, you know, fucking slaps <laughs> from like 19 to 26, man. Like I, I've seen that too. Um, and, and I think the only thing that I would say, again, in terms of leverage and the value prop to like come coach with us is we're going to put you in a best in the world system. We are going to get you access to best in the world tools. You get access to best, best in the world certifications which to a degree act as like a qualifier for certain MLB level jobs or college jobs, if that's a thing that you want. And in the meantime, you get a chance to coach with within a structure that is like, look, man, this as an outcome is great. It's not my North Star. So if you're that coach who is like player development minded and you want to have 10 months of recurring contact with your athletes and the ability to like really, really, really develop, really develop with athletes who are at a stage biologically where they are more adaptable to stimulus than almost at any other time. Again, Rick James Chappelle thing, like come, come talk to us. Teamwork online, drivelinebaseball.com slash careers. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's just, a, it's a good chance to become like, like you're saying, like a, a true leader. Like there's, there's people who have a great understanding of this game who want to make that jump into coaching, who jump right into higher levels and kind of fail because they, all they know is, oh, this is how I did it. This is how I did it or whatever. But to actually become a leader of a team and younger players and like learn how to be that, like you said, uh, like a guiding figure, it's just there's nothing like coaching youth baseball for for that kind of stress test that you keep saying. And and that's the other thing. It's just like, man, you're going to come in and you're going to fall in love with it because, because, because you get that like that constant hip of like how, how fucking great it is when a kid figures some stuff out. Mm-hmm. Joe on our 13s last night uh, had a monster PR. Uh, monster hit a, over the green monster. A, a yeah. monster PR over the green monster in our hit tracks games uh, against like a really gross curveball. Like when you get a chance to be in an ecosystem that provides that type of stimulus that the athletes are feeling, and then you get a chance to feel somewhat uh, in, in some way in shape or form responsible or participatory in that moments, man, like it manages, it, it fills the proverbial cup, mm-hmm. you know, like it, it fills the proverbial cup. And the only other thing that I'll say before we kind of move on from the hiring thing, coaching, coaching with access to tools or whatever, is I want to make it very, very fucking plain that we are not looking for male baseball coaches. We are looking for coaches. Mm -hmm. I have made this point before, and I will make it again. Uh, At the recreational Little League baseball level, pony wall, whatever. What do we struggle with? Coaches. What do we also do? We tell 50% of the fucking population that, like, this isn't a place for you. And a specific 50% of the population that if I had to place a bet are people who are more emotionally sensitive to the needs of you, structure, training, and direction of young players. It's a good bet. Like, like, I mean, honestly, if, if I just had to put money on a table about like, who's the more likely to be a psychopath, baseball dad, baseball mom, I've seen both. I like, I, we've all seen both, but if I had to, if I had to lay money on who's going to be more emotionally considerate and again, at the 12 and under level, what's the thing that matters most fun and skill, but, but probably fun. I think probably above that. Right. Cause like we, we got time for skill. If they fucking hate baseball because it's brought to them in the container of some asshole that is like out of step with their expectations and they're terrible at communicating and they don't like, it's just, it goes bad and it goes bad quickly. So uh, if you played fast pitch and you want to coach, okay, come talk to us. Cause like Mm -hmm. Rachel Balkovic is doing a hell of a job coaching in the Yankees right now. Developing Jason Dominguez right now. Who the fuck am I to go like, oh, you play like high level softball and you're an excellent leader and an excellent communicator, but like you can't coach a a baseball team because of which bathroom you go in. Like, fuck that. Yeah. Like no fucking way. 
I will take leaders and I will take communicators and all that other shit is just secondary. It is tertiary even. A hundred percent. I'm an English major. Yeah. I, uh, I could not agree with that more. Uh, that's, you know, the, the term dad coach is there for a reason. Like these are not by and large positive influences on the game. Yep. And uh, I think it is more than time to, yep. to give uh, a lot of women opportunities. Uh, so please apply because we've gotten a few applications and, and no female applications yet. So, so please apply. Uh, yeah, like um, I, make sure yeah. you get in there. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we mentioned a lot of like, you know, volleys, people mm -hmm. like that, who get, not just for people who want to coach at pro or college level. If you want to be a better high school coach, Come and come and coach at the Driveline Youth Academy, better high school softball or baseball coach. It doesn't matter. You still get access to all of our certifications. You get a lot of technical skill training. You don't have to just want to be a professional coach or a sure. college coach. You're right. To get a lot out of what we provide at whatever level you want to coach at. Um, so that's yeah. That's All about spreading the knowledge to high school baseball. I'm I mean, baby. from a high school coach. I'm baby. Yep. Oh, and we also pay you. We're not going to expect you to work for free. So I should probably mention that. Yeah, we pay pretty well. Pretty yeah. well. So anyways, there's there's one segment. Oh, and come, the, come talk to the last thing I will say on this, we did say a lot about assholes sure. and, and how they're the worst kinds of coach. That's not the only kind of bad coach you can be. Uh, you can be a very nice guy and not give a shit about sure. about your job being there, which I think we ran into a few with a few coaches this year on, on the driveline staff who... Uh, if you don't actually care about being there and making it a fun environment, um, it isn't for you. It isn't for you. And, and you, if you don't intentionally create a fun environment, you are creating a non-fun environment. Yeah. And, and like, that is a, a really important thing for us as well as like, we don't just want non-assholes. We definitely don't want assholes, but we also want people who like actually have a very high rating on the give a shit meter. Like you're, yes. you're going to be here. You're going to care about these kids. You're going to build a relationship with them and you're going to be someone that they are excited to come to practice and see. Uh, I think that that is like what I strive to do with my kids. And I think that that's like what the best coaches kind of do is like when your kids show up, are they excited to see you? Or like, if you don't show up that day, uh, are they going to be really upset? Like I'm not going to the tournament next weekend. Cause I have a wedding, unfortunately. Uh, and my kids are like really bummed that I'm not going to the tournament. <laughs> and I am also bummed. Uh, I didn't expect them to be more bummed than I was about yeah. missing the tournament. But like, that's a, that's a really good thing that like, they want their coach there. Like not, I tell you when I was growing up, there was never a thought in my mind. It was like, oh man, coach isn't here. Oh, that's a bummer. Sure. And like, that's, that's a really important thing is like the environment that you set. You don't just have to be an asshole to set a bad environment. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, I think the thing for us is that like, because what we do at the academy is just like constantly iterate and we're just broadly like never satisfied never uh, i mean I'd, I'd love to i'd love to get to that place progress not perfection hum babe uh but like the reason that we constantly iterate is it's like you know you just run into some of these challenges right and i think when you're kind of backed onto your heels right and and i'll just kind of quick disclaimer you know we we grew in a way in year two that i think was unexpected uh and i think because of which stress tested some of the systems that we had for things like hiring and coach education and yada yada. So like we've, we've spent a lot of time in the last 120 ish days, like leaning into the system thing. I mean, we've talked system, system, system since we started this podcast and understand that that stuff, that flywheel is turning for us internally constantly. Um, so like, yeah, we need a better funnel to kind of make sure we find those people at first who are the give a shit meter is very, very high, right? And, and then you essentially equip them with, again, our structure, tools, systems, and support. And again, this, this other thing, which we haven't really talked about, which is integrating uh, the academy into the, the main training floor, right? Like, which is a, a real big step. It starts for us in July and kind of just sets the template for what season three looks like is going to be so impactful um and, and i think pushes in a place where where again maybe we don't hit perfection next year in season three i'd certainly like to think that but i guarantee you that what we do will do is make a shit ton of progress in season three we are going to continue to like identify snakes that need to be shot and fucking shoot because like that's the that's the mission um so drivelinebaseball.com slash careers i think is still the current thing teamwork online teamwork online yeah do, do the whole thing hit it's us on, up on twitter it's on all of our socials linkedin um, yeah, you actually use your LinkedIn for something positive. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so there's that. I think the only other thing we, we wanted to talk about is uh, 
So Danny and I were coming home uh, in the car on Tuesday. We had an on-field practice. Uh, was it? No, we were going to. We were going. We were going down to Kent for for the on-field. And he's like, "Dad, I want to search for like what people like how to throw harder on Twitter and on YouTube and on TikTok." And I was like, "Holy fuck, this is gonna be a disaster." But the the interesting thing is, is again, because unfortunately my son has to live with me and listen to me blather about this shit all the time, right? But also because he's been here, I think he has a age appropriate level of understanding of what is important <laughs> and like, and how to get there, right? So we're going through all these TikTok results of like how to throw harder. And it is a fucking salad buffet of horrible, like, like not even, not even just like broadly inaccurate, or, or just like misinformed, right? Because there's some of that stuff too. Like there's the guys you can find on Instagram who will show you like a, a skeleton's UCL and then they make broad uh, presumptions about like, well, the, the cadaver doesn't move this way. So you need to be like hyper vigilant to avoid this position when you're throwing. And like, fuck, that's not how this works. Or what you retweeted with the the comment on the you Darvish's kid. Oh God. With like you Darvish standing right behind the kid and... MLB personnel sitting right behind the car. <laughs> yeah, but the, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, for anybody that isn't deep in the world of youth baseball, Twitter, because and you're probably making a better career choice than I am. Uh, you Darvish's kid, shocker, throws the ball pretty fucking well. Yeah. Uh, and and you know it gets posted, and the kid, you know, he's he's like 14 years old. I guess he's somewhere around mid seven. Somebody said, which is a great place to be at 14. At 14. And of course it gets posted and there's just like this litany of, of, you know, the eye Soto guys, right? Like I have the rap Soto is just like in my eye and I can see shit and interpret mechanical flaw. And some, you know, some fucking jabroni is like, Oh, you know, the wrist is too cocked. So that's like elbow injury. Yeah. Motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. You don't know that. You don't know that. And like, and, and I will go one step further. Like almost nobody knows that. Right. But like what we do is we just eyeball shit and then cast aspersion and like prediction of injury against children, which is fucking stupid. Um, so, so anyways, so Dan, so Danny's, you know, just like, I'm so glad I got a chance to like provide stewardship for this experience because he's also 13 and you know, and, and I don't know if he listens to someone and they say something with conviction that he's just not going to go like, Oh, well that's what it is. Or like you do some like super salad mechanical analysis of someone and make some point about something. And then you show Clayton Kershaw. Like what people do is they, they try to make a point and they'll draw a direct correlation between like how they're trying to substantiate that point with a guy that they never fucking worked with. But if you're a child, it's, it's really hard to interpret that signal, right? Because it, it's like, oh, well, I, I can see the path A, B to C. You know, I mean, not even for a child. I did that for four or five years ago before I like really started diving into like sure. what is actually important, like you're saying. I mean, and I know parents do it too. They yep. they see a video of someone and someone explaining, oh, well, look at this, these positions they get into. And they're like, oh, that sounds pretty good. And they go off of that. And like, so yeah, not even just for children, but children especially. Right. I mean, and it's, it's I think it is, you're a hundred percent right. It's compelling for everyone because when you speak from a position of authority and that authority or experience or knowledge isn't qualified, it's, it's really compelling to like, cause what you're saying is like, well, don't you want your child to move like Clayton Kershaw? Well, fucking, of course I do. Right. Like, don't, don't you want your kid to look like Mike Trout? Of course I do. Like, absolutely. There's no parent in the country who has a kid that plays baseball that's going to answer those questions no. But the issue is, is that, like, the argument you're trying to present isn't gated from a position of knowledge or actual authority. It's just, like, it's a fucking guess. So, anyways, so we get these videos. And, like, the first one he sees is this guy who is, he's doing the, the, the thing where you, like, manipulate the elbow here and the front side here and the head has to... So it's like, all right, well, uh, that ain't it and then and then the guy is like actively telling kids that they shouldn't throw across their body i i can't i really can't think of an athlete at anything resembling an elite level where like the movement pattern is all on this side and there isn't i'm trying to think i was trying to think like 
is he saying like go into out? Yeah, like just straight. One of those. Like, yeah. You, you throw your arm goes the other way. Yeah. 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 And Won't like, cause any any injuries or. So it's like, you know so you know Danny's going through this stuff and I'm and and it's like he's kind of he plays the video and you hear the commentary and it's like you know this is just fucking wrong 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 wrong, but because you can't like plug the hole in the dam relative to the internet and distribution of information. And because, you know, most parents, uh, not only like me didn't play high level baseball, but also have not devoted their life and changed their career to like understanding this thing. Uh, you, they don't know either. Yeah. They don't know either. So it's just like, it is a complete fucking minefield of misinformation and it's like, uh, well, you know, and it's like the least, the most innocuous ones are like do long toss. Okay. I mean, sure. Yes. Like a structured long toss program, I suppose, could be effective at building velocity. Why? Because it builds intention. Right? Like, it, which again, same fucking thing we talk about all the time. The point is to get good at moving fast. The point is not to get good at moving slow. So, so yeah, like to a degree uh doing more long toss i suppose you could draw a correlation between that and, and increased output and there's at least a logical step right <laughs> sure <laughs> but if i'm not in the car with my kid when he's reading that and if he infers well i should just do more long toss then his health like his literal health is going to be decided by to, to, to whatever degree he interprets more to be you know is more him, uh, like, let's say you listen to Alan Jager, right? Alan Jager is going to tell you to do more long toss, but he's also going to tell you to listen to your arm, right? And to a degree, this is like the same thing we've talked about before. The reason we all, like, want sandlock baseball to be a thing is because kids are self-regulating within that environment. They are literally, like, picking teams and distributing talent, right? And then they're self-regulating matchups within that because they listen to their own bodies. We play Sandlot baseball until we're tired and then we kind of stop. Well, if you are in a tournament and you have to play seven games in three days, you don't, you can't fucking stop. It's not an option. Um, so yeah, like best case scenario, you listen to Alan Jager and he's going to tell you to listen to your arms. So you long toss more and, and let's hope that like the stress and stimulus is periodized in a way that you get benefit from that. The other thing you're opening up a can of worms for is for a child to go, I'm in a max effort long toss seven days a week in a period of time where I, maybe I should be throwing, like shutting down from throwing. And now all of a sudden it's like you start your off season training in October and your arms blown up because you listen to some fucking dummy on the internet that said you should long toss more, you know, like there's no structure. Uh, the other thing that there was there is, Oh, you should, uh, is somebody, well, you should do bands. Like really? I mean, sure. Bands is a pre throwing a uh, warmup modality. A hundred thousand percent. You won't find me on a field without a set of bands uh, in one of my bags, and I generally bring extras because, like, I'm that committed to the training modality. I don't think it's reasonable to go, like, you could do an infinite number of bands, and you're going to see a shit ton of uh, increase in throwing velocity. Why would you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's even to just, like, you know, come from our own standpoint. Like, if we were to just go out there and say, throw more plyos, like how dangerous would that be to say oh to throw hard you just need to throw more plyos it's so like no whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. yeah there's there's a lot that goes into that and if you don't have someone kind of like sifting through and saying okay well what does that structure look like how do we uh how does it impact your arm health and like how do we take all those variables into consideration then yeah you're gonna no matter what it is it's gonna be somewhat dangerous even if even if it's the right thing like you know we think throwing plyos is great Hundred percent in the right, in the right yeah. setting, compared to with structure. with structure. With structure, and you know, there's those. Uh, we see those studies of like plyos hurt kids or whatever, and it's like they're throwing uh, the black plyo forty times in a span of two days or whatever, and it's or whatever. We're, do, the, we're you doing peel two, one layer, and you realize, oh, well, that's why the kid got hurt. Okay, yeah, yeah we're sense. doing two pound pull downs at week three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, if you design that study, fuck you. Yeah. How, yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. like so, honestly, yeah. So no matter what it is, is long like, and that's why I think those videos are so, especially, you know, I'm not gonna sound like old man yelling at cloud here, but no, that's, like, I'll do that. Yeah, but like in this era of like TikTok, where it's thirty seconds of how to throw harder, it's like people write 
50 page programs right. that aren't even enough information to, right. to do this. And it's like, yeah, the, the 12 second video isn't going to really help you. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, and this is, you know, I got in an argument with some guy the other day uh, about just like overload training, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the guy is is all, you know, uh, all hot and bothered. He goes like, well, underload training is fine, but you shouldn't have kids throw balls heavier than five ounces. And it's like, all right. If that's the card you're playing, first of all, what you're telling me is no you, more you, football. Well, right. Oh, the throwing bush is different. All right, whatever, man. Uh, well, first of all, the thing you are fundamentally understanding is the thing that's been substantiated by ASMI, by our studies, by a fuck ton of other studies, which is that as ball weight decreases, kinetic forces on the joint increase. Why? Because you're moving faster. This shouldn't, like, I'm kind of dumb, but I get that. Overload training, you move slower. Kinetics at the joint are reduced. So if if your position is like, well, you should do all the underload throwing that you can, and you should never throw anything heavier than five ounces, you're going to fuck kids up. Mm -hmm. Like, and right. the thing that, that I always constantly struggle with is I can't think of a product that we sell that isn't paired with a structured training program that you get for free. Sure, you can do all the other stuff you want and get access to online training, hacking the kinetic chain, hacking the kinetic chain youth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all of that stuff is just doing deeper levels of structure. So, so again, one of the things that like when when he pulls up this how to throw harder, it was like uh, some guys were doing like reverse throws, like throwing to a partner, and I was like, mm, uh, okay, like. I mean, all right. Uh, and then it was just like uh, really, really bad pivot picks um, with like no cap on volume or structure sure. and intensity. And it's like, uh, yeah, man, I'm sure that like, you know, at a baseline, what we want to try to do is is the free program is is more meat and potatoes, right? It's not going to be putting you in like a, a, a structure where you are getting so much stimulus, you need additional guidance for how to manage it. You know, the, the youth intra arm care program, meat and potatoes, warm up before your game, warm up before practice, right? There's there's nothing there's nothing there. But then it's like you have some guy that's like, well, I'm going to make this thing my own. And I've just decided we are going to do, you know, a 10, uh, a 10 by or a, a 10 by 10 by 10 of green, blue, red pivot picks. Like, OK, good luck. But when kids get injured because of that shit, the, the frustrating thing is they go, oh, well, there's a driveline logo on the plyo. Right. Therefore, we bear the burden of responsibility. And it's like, no, man, I, I gave you a manual for how to operate this car. That manual did not say run it off the fucking bridge. So if you run the car off the fucking bridge, who, who bears responsibility, you know? And th so the other thing that we saw in those same videos is like, um, somebody was like, well, increase your external rotation. Okay, this is like, uh, how are you going to win the 100 meter sprint in the Olympics? Run fast. Run fast. Run faster. Yeah. yeah. Fucking yeah. light bulb, dude. Yeah. They, like, <laughs> nailed it. Great. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I don't know what the point of this is, other than to just say that, like, I think for, for parents and coaches, be aware that your kids have access to, like, more information than you could possibly understand, specifically if they're into baseball, because, like, my son's 13. We allowed him to get his own Instagram account. He follows a shit ton of baseball accounts on Instagram. So if you look at his Discover page, it's just like it's it's everything in there and there's no quality filter. And 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 that's fine. But like be aware of the information that your kids are consuming because some of this is just like not it's not great. And the last thing that you could have, or the, the worst thing you want to have is kids who internalize some of that stuff and then they bring it into you. Right. So so I think for us, one of the things we're kind of attacking as we move into the launch of season three is a player on board, right? Like we're talking about just how we create structure to communicate to kids right off top, which is later substantiated by the coaches, what's good? Like what what is good? Yeah. What is good is not well, today's a recovery day, but I'm going to I'm going to just do hybrid volume and intensity. That's not good. We have to take responsibility for kind of communicating that stuff uh at a really really high level because you have to be mindful of all the information these kids are taking in like yeah. you just can't you can't plug the hole in that dam
Well, it's, it's what we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? Like if you, you have to give them, provide them with the information you want them to have, otherwise they're just going to look at the wrong shit. Yep. It, yeah. And it, and it, you're exactly right. And it's just as important for the players as it is for the parents. Yes. Like it's, it's the whole deal. Yeah. And like players, I would even argue more so, well, depending on the dad or mom. Yeah. Uh, although very rarely moms, again, very rarely moms, but uh, the players I'd argue more so because like example, you know, I had the 13 year last night who, uh, believes he's struggling hitting fastballs which there's no proof to but it's just mental uh so he went on youtube and looked up how to get a you know how to how to be better at hitting fastballs sure uh <laughs> the info right okay here, oh. here we go here we go down this path the information that he found was uh that the best way that you can do it and i don't know what video this was i don't ever want to know was to track so not not swing just get in the cage and look at the pitches so that you can like get your timing down before you actually swing the bat. So he asked me if he could do that. To which I responded, uh, this cage is curveball only. <laughs> so sure. like you're just thinking way too much. Yes. If you are like that, you know, this is a you're you're just way too in your head if you don't even realize that these are curveballs coming in and like staring at them to judge up a fastball is not gonna not gonna help you there. Yeah. Uh, but like we had to talk about it and it was like a productive conversation because I was able to provide him with you know, the context of like, you're really not bad at hitting fastballs. Yeah. You just think you are. And like you thinking you are is making you late because you're indecisive on every yep. swing that you make. So it has yep. nothing to do with uh, like a flaw in your swing. It's your indecisiveness because you are thinking way too much about yep. the fact that you can't hit fastballs. Yep. And like he, he seemed to understand that. And it was like, you know, a good conversation, but like I had to provide him with that information. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to go look at a dumb video about how to just stand in a cage without a bat and look at a baseball to get better at hitting and like yeah, yeah. well good enough for edgar martinez <laughs> well hey look man uh edgar martinez hits balls i don't know i, I mean we didn't have stat cast bat then back then but like i don't know 105 110 doesn't really seem out of the ballpark uh so number one yeah. square hole round pick yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is just like this is the same reason like you know uh again chad longworth shout out uh my buddy chad uh is very big on getting kids off of the tee because what you really need to do is you need to pair perception with movement so it's like yeah you can sit in the cage and watch heaters all fucking day great uh and to a degree i mean I, for years you know what do i talk to my kids about when they're in the dugout well when your teammates up to bat you should be taking mental reps in the dugout and like and, and going through that process, right? But even that process, I'm I'm asking them to imagine a paired movement and perception solution. You can't there's no fucking point to developing those things not in concert with each other. It, mm -hmm. Because that's not the task. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Unless we want to create like a like a teen T ball league. And nobody's asking for that. You don't want the, the army of perfect swings. You want the army of guys who can actually hit the ball. Ugly swings matter. Ugly swings matter. I yell at my kids all the time. Ugly, Ugly swings matter. matter. Like, you know, and, and again, like, so well, what's the what's the whole story on that? Hitting is a task defined by variation. It's a defined by variation of movement. It's defined by a variation of problem. The problem being where the incoming pitch is, when, where you need to swing. If you're not training in consideration of those two things, you're fucked. You're, you're just fucked. Mm-hmm. And, and again, so the, the big concern a lot of times is like, well, if we just groove one good looking swing, then I, then I think that that plays in other places. But like, why would it? You're, you're building a, a car for a quarter mile drag strip. Well, guess what? You have to turn left and right on this motherfucker. You, this is an off-road course. It's an off-road course. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is, you're going off-road. Yeah. This is a rally course. Yeah. This is a rally course. Uh, you you just have to train in consideration. Um, so yeah, I mean, I you know I think uh, for parents and coaches, it's just one of those things where you know it, it's good to to be mindful of the information your kids take in, and and probably honestly like opening up a two way discussion, like like you know we've talked a lot about uh, doing a better job of communicating uh, specific intentions, specific blocks of training to players specifically. I think the interesting thing that we we could we could consider not to turn this into our department stand up, but like uh, some sort of frequency of like engaging with kids and having them ask questions of us, right? Like doing a better job. And that's one of the things we've already talked about for next year. Again, I will stop this from being like a driveline Academy weekly stand up part two. Um, so the only other thing we can talk about, we can wrap is uh, this, this big fucker right here. 
Um, Shout out to both of our 18U teams who um, 18U College Prep went out and uh, won uh, this thing at their first uh, perfect game event, the PLU Invitational. Our other 18U team uh, went out and won uh, Drive Line Over Bay. Drive Line Over Bay. Shout out to Lyle Over Bay. Uh, won the Camp Christian event on the same on the same weekend on the same day. Mm-hmm. Um, and first of all, I want to celebrate those kids um, because, uh, like in the our college prep team, they got in the championship, and you know you you run out of arms. I mean, you you just you, you kind of run out of body. Like the sixth or seventh game yep. that weekend. Yep, <laughs> and. Um, and if I remember correctly, I want to say Noah Seabrands came out and started that game. Yeah, he did. And, you know, Noah um, has gotten a heck of a lot better when when we've had him. Um, I don't think he is on a, a PO track, you know, yeah. like, I, and, and that's fine. Yeah. But I was, man, I was so happy to see them make that choice. Because, because for coaches, I think the choice is, it's very binary. Do you either run a kid back out who you know has already given you what they got when they pitched previously? Or do you open up this door to go like, hey, we have to play this game. We need a pitcher. But but we are going to play our asses off on defense behind a kid who hasn't pitched yet and may not be pitching as their specialty because I know if I do that other thing, I am like robbing Peter to pay Paul. I am potentially jeopardizing a kid's health at the expense of winning this thing which is cool and great but like the fact that they went out and not only made that choice and our coaches made that choice uh but but that the kids played behind them uh and and like and got down on that game and i think it came back and went like man i just just so just so overjoyed and happy for those kids uh same thing with 18u over bay um you know they went through a gauntlet of teams um in that division and and came out on top um and i'm just man i'm so happy for those kids yeah, and, and, you know, winning is is not everything to us. Correct. But we do like to do it. Correct. Yeah, we do we do like to win, and it does provide some value, and it's always good for kids to be able to see those results. Yep. And, like, see that the hard work, especially once you get to that age with the 18U teams, like, 11U, who the hell cares? But, like, an 18U, like, that is a pretty big deal to win an 18U tournament and beat some of the top teams in the state and get seen by maybe some scouts that are yep. at that game and, and things like that and and – we we do celebrate this even though like wins aren't aren't the aren't our north star as you say like yeah. it is really nice to to get that gratification for those kids who, who yeah, and work I, their butts off yep. and i think i think you like you're talking about the 11 u versus 18 u difference and you know we we stress player development right is our number one goal here um you know and the player development is we only get youth athletes until they're 18 right yep. and then they go off to college and or straight to the pros if they're lucky enough um but so, you know, that player development, we can stress to our younger teams, you know, wins don't matter. We're, we're, we're kind of building for a bigger future. At 18, you know, that's, yep. that's where is this player development working or not? Yep. You know, we have, to, we have to assess is the product we're putting out on the field when they're 18 a product that we're proud of based on the development that they've made over the last five or six years eventually, yep. but currently just two, three years, whatever. Um, but so wins at an 18 year level yeah they do send a bigger signal than wins at an 11 12 year year old yeah and it's and it's an accurate signal right like that's that's i think the the critical thing is and and to be really clear like the reason that we kind of have the the posture uh, and structure of our program for the 12 and down level is just a is a very clear acknowledgement which is that the most important games that you play importance being in Big air quotes. The most important games that you play shouldn't be when you are fucking prepubescent. Yeah. Because the optimization path for that is very different than the path that helps you be competitive on a 90 foot field. Yeah. Like it's just, it just is, right? Like you, I think 12 and under winning really is minimizing your failures and maximizing the other team's failures, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Like, and, it, and it's much less decided by uh, outcome and approach. And it's just like how, can you turn the stress dial up to 11 on that other team, right? And you take advantage of the fact that whether they are either uh, tactically uh, insolvent, right? If, if they if they just, you know, shitty first and thirds at 11, okay? Like, 
you can take advantage of that. And, and it's the same thing we've talked about before, where like a walk is a triple. Mm-hmm. A walk is a triple. And it's, and it's sometimes a home run because catching is also like broadly underdeveloped. That shit isn't true at 18, right? It's, it's just not. So like... Talent levels show a little more on the field rather than the tactical game. Right. And, and you have more time to, to teach and learn the tactical side of the game over time. But like what we do all too often is we front load that stuff because we're terrified about the context that I have to deal with of losing. So why do we lose 1.2 million kids every year in the transition from like six to 12 to 13 to 17? I will be on my deathbed arguing that it's like we are underdeveloping them for the skill needed for an inevitable transition. An but at inevitable least do, transition. At least they can do first and thirds at 12 True. years old. They just can't make the throw from third to first anymore. Yeah. So like, <laughs> and, and again, you know, same old thing. High school baseball trial, you're 15 years old. Kid, where do you play? I play third base. Well, if you do not have a round set of skills that allow you to be viable on other places in the field, you got a problem. Oh, yeah. and, and then if the skill that you present, I am fucking 80 grade elite at first and thirds, decision making process, great. If you can't throw the ball across the diamond, you have one place you can play. You can play second base and you can hide that kid there. But like the reality is, is that you can't even hide that kid and they're not going to get a roster spot because if they're 10 miles an hour down on bat speed and 10 miles down on thrown ball velocity, you're going to have that kid who like is salad in the field, but it's a good bat. So you need to play them second. Mm -hmm. So incoming freshman limited skill set that doesn't translate. Like you're going to show up to your high school baseball tryout. They're going to cut you. It's going to be embarrassing. And then you quit baseball. Mm Mm-hmm. And that is a shitty outcome. Yeah. It's just a shit outcome. Avoidable. Very avoidable. A hundred percent. Because all we're talking about is just like a change of a, a change in decision making in like the five years previous. Right. That like, it, it's just, it's just decisions in time. You don't have an unlimited amount of it. Uh, even in the club select travel ball space, we can't practice with the same degree of frequency in duration that the Japanese all-star teams like practice. Mm -hmm. That's just not a thing. And I don't even know that that's really advisable because you probably as an 11 year old want to play soccer and basketball and do Taekwondo or whatever. You're learning how to solve different problems. If you just over optimize on the baseball side, you're going to get really, really good at a specific type of baseball skill. That's going to make you a shitty athlete when you're 15. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's just, it's just poor decisions. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think, again, uh, the reason that, like, I'm fine putting this thing up here front and center is specifically because the accuracy of the signal. It's just it, it's just much more accurate than it is 11, 12. Um, and I think, you know, we talked about this, about, like, displaying this in the gym. You know, like, how do we make sure that parents understand that this is only important because it's at this level, right? It's, yeah, we it's, wouldn't display an 11U trophy. I mean, yeah, I just don't like I, because I think we know if you if you really spend enough time in the ecosystem and you watch it with clear eyes, you understand that there is a game theory optimal path for winning at these younger, younger kids, smaller fields, hotter bats. If you're playing the triple, the U trip whole thing, which is a whole other fucking can of worms, um, there's a path there that's really, really optimal for winning. And it is almost 180 degrees away from the path of competitive 90 foot baseball player. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I don't know if I want to go too into details about our program, but you know, this happened to line up with um, some of our 18 U players being invited to a uh, PBR yep. uh, showcase. Right. Because this signal because is stronger. Yeah. Yep. Is that, Oh, you have a team that can compete for 18 U championships. There must be good players. Yes. And, and players that are developed at the right level, you know, to go play college baseball. You know, an 11 you if you win a trophy, you're not going to go then get start getting college baseball offers or whatever. I mean, 2032 uncommitted or whatever. Uncommitted 2029. Yeah. Uh, oh. But, you know, but 18 you you know, that's the kind of door. Yep. The, yep. That's like we're just saying. It's just another example of how that signal is stronger is like, oh, you have a team that can win a championship at an 18-year-old level that team happens to be filled with guys who hit the ball 103, 105 miles an hour. And it's like, yeah, there's, there's your signal. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. coincidence that that invite came right after the teams <laughs> won. 
Yeah. Not a coincidence. Yeah. No, kudos to those kids, man. I'm, I'm just super proud, happy for them. I'm, I'm really happy with, you know, our coaches being able to put together that effort. Um, it's just, a, you know, I think it is a good example of like, you know, really for, for parents uh, at the younger level to just like understand, you know, what are, like, what are you really building towards? You know, are you building towards, uh, you know, a $4 uh, tournament medal that like your child is going to discard in their room? And, and really they care just about as much as that as they do about the, the Dairy Queen blizzard that you get for them. Like it's, it's, it's fine, but we, we just have to be able to be equipped at these younger ages to provide different type of context. Yeah. And, you know, for, for me, I think the, the longer that we, we go in this thing, I just, uh, I become all the more, more convicted that a lot of just like the base features of the tournament ecosystem are not serving what we really want. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's tough because you know, you're going to have competitive kids at the younger ages. Um, and I think it is reasonable to want those kids that are, that are a little bit more competitive, uh, at the younger ages to have, uh, commensurate competition, right? So sometimes you, you can't just eat your own food to get that thing, right? Sometimes you have to find another program. Um, and again, the, the whole point is just like to stress test the stuff you're working on in training. Um, but when it goes the other way, when you just end up on this, just like full game, 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 game path, man, I, um, I, I just, I don't think that's, I, I just, anyways. Well, uh, and like, they didn't play harder to win this than they did the previous tournament. Right. Right. Like, it wasn't like that there was something special that they put together this last weekend. They go out there and they have since their, the yep. 18 new college prep season started and they compete like dogs. They're, right. They are out there competing every game. They almost won the last tournament. Yep. And now they got this one, maybe the next tournament. Same as the results, the first one, and they, they lose in the semifinal or whatever, and they, they don't get to take home a trophy. And that doesn't change the fact that they competed like dogs and, and put in really good work and, and got to see the results of the the process. Yeah. Uh, and, like, it is always nice to get this and have that validation for them. Uh, but this doesn't really mean that they played any different or right. that they did anything differently in in the long run. Uh, these kids just go out and compete every every tournament and like some tournaments you'll come home with these and some you won't. And that's baseball. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and again, to a degree, I think that the signal in terms of player development is the same at 18 U as it is 11 in that, uh, when you show up and you're 18, you're going into your 18 U season and you throw 85 and you're getting offers from, you know, uh, junior colleges. That's, that's great. That that's a great thing to do <laughs> when you go from 85 to 91 and you offer open up D one offers. Well, you're exercising more control over the future of your path than attending a crap ton of showcases mm -hmm. is ever going to to provide, Correct. right? Just because, because the accuracy of the signal, the accuracy of the signal in terms of what it projects for you, and like in the in the thing, is that you can understand that at 18, but you can also understand that path at 13. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can essentially go like, hey, this is where you are at 13. The goal is to do this, and we're going to continue to build and build and build and build and build in a way that just puts you on a path where you get to make choices about where you want your baseball life to take you as opposed to not having choices, which is the other alternative mm -hmm. because you under-index for the power of how you can get better. Like, it's just it's just a thing. So uh, we'll wrap this thing up. I will say, um, you know, for, for that specific message, if you have not watched it, uh, as soon as you turn this thing off, go to the Driveline YouTube page, pull up Casey Weathers' How Good Am I video, and, like, watch it three times. Like, wa watch it three times. Uh, I, I honestly think that, like, for our player onboarding next year, I'm just going to have a link to that video. Uh 1078. Uh, because I, I just think if there's if there's one message about driveline that I think I would want people to understand, it, it's not technology, it's not data, it's not all these tools and shit. It is the same stuff that resonated for Kyle when he was talking about it like in 09. Do you want to get better? Like this is a thing that you can measure, and all you need to do is work your ass off, you know, like and, and you can get there. Like that that's a thing. Uh, and you can get there in a way that it is not contingent upon the approval of some fat old guy like me sitting on a bucket. You get a chance to take authority over how good you want to be. And, hey man, at the end of the day, hard work gives you honesty. Uh, not every kid, uh, you know, on, our, on the 18 U's is going to go play professional baseball. 
I would say that if you survey both of those teams, probably all of them want to. What we want to provide, though, is the opportunity to have an honest assessment of, of how good you were. And, and the only way that you do that is you have an exhaustive search and you check the boxes. You commit your ass off, you work really fucking hard, and you attack the things that are most significant leverage to get better. Yeah. Um, so, Casey Weathers, shout out. Love that dude. Got a chance to meet him in person at spring training. It was great. Uh, so yeah, that's all we got for the Dryland Academy podcast. Devin, Tony, Jeremy, and myself, uh, hope you enjoyed this uncensored version. We probably won't be doing this often because I don't want to scare away the audience, but you got a chance to just hear like some real baseball talk today. Um, and next time, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but uh, because our lives revolve around nothing else but youth baseball, I'm sure we will have a lot to talk about. So thank you guys. We'll catch you later. <laughs>